please welcome her. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. I mean, I, we have, we're such a nice small group that I think I wouldn't mind if I heard your names. And uh, June Marble, Middle East Center at the University of Utah. I'm the academic advisor there. And I also work with the Outreach Program. Wonderful. I'm Simone Arias, and I teach at Hoover High School. <coughs> you might from here. Ah. In English. In English. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Bram Huppel. I teach at Friends Seminary in New York City. And I um, teach um, AP World in Middle Eastern History. Now, Persian language today, the, the language we call modern Persian, actually dates from the 9th, 10th, 11th centuries. It's, it's not that modern, so the term is a bit of a misnomer when we say modern. But by modern, what we mean is that the language of pre-Islamic Iran, ancient Iran, uh, was Persian. But it was either Old Iranian or Middle Persian. And these languages did not share the alphabet we have today which somebody might have covered, but just in case, quickly, because after the arrival of Islam, and you might hear, if you are you hang out with a lot of Iranians, they refer to it as, not so kindly as the arrival of Islam, but as the barbaric <laughs> uh, capturing of Iran by Arabs at the arrival of Islam. It is the arrival of Islam. Anyway, the, uh, in the seventh century, that is, but it's a transition period, it's not as if Islam came into the country. The dominant religion before was Zoroastrianism. And Islam arrives. It takes some time. Sometimes in Iranian historiography, in popular historiography, we represent it as a like, bang, overnight everything changed. It did. But the Arabic alphabet was adopted as the um, alphabet of modern Persian. And if you ask my college, Turaj, why that happened. It wasn't because it was forced down upon anyone's throat, but rather because it made more sense. The alphabet that was used for, first of all, there wasn't a unified language in the Great Persian Empire. They used many different languages, but that the alphabet was cuneiform. So it didn't have the range, the possibilities that Arabic alphabet actually helped in the creation of modern, what we call modern Persian, which is the language we really also use in speaking and writing. So um, when we look at Persian literature, the development of modern Persian literature, um, we often, we, you know, literary historiography, seems to always begin. Again, that's a bit of a myth, but we, you will come across it. If you look at anthologies, you look, look, at, look at translations, what's available. The Shahnameh, the Book of the Kings. Right? Shahnameh, literally, Nameh uh, in contemporary Persian is used in the sense of a letter, hmm? but it can refer to a work. But Shah, uh, meaning the king, Shahnameh, Book of the Kings is often translated as. And it is in verse, it's some 50,000 couplets. <laughs> and it is the story and the legends, pre Islamic legends dating back to sort of the mythical Iran, the poet Shedrasi put it into modern verse. These various versions of the stories that he collected and put in the Book of the Kings existed. And were, some of them were uh, perhaps uh, bits and pieces we know as extant in Middle Persian in these various, and then you know Arabic, because Arabic became the media, medium through which some of the texts were transported and brought into modern version. So the Book of the Kings, it's quite good reading, and it's been translated by wonderful translators. I think the most recent one is by Dick Davis, our colleague who is a wonderful poet himself. Uh, I think Jerry Clinton also did a translation. I really, if you're interested, it's, it's great stories. You know, I always tell my students um, when we read for world literature reading, it's like reading, it's, it's in fact, well, I'm biased, I think it's better than reading the Iliad or the Odyssey. We, we tend to say, aha, this is the beginning of modern Persian literature because it is also, the text itself, the poetry is about the concept of an identity uh, as an Iranian. Hmm? 
one of the things I should have said at the beginning, you know, you've heard, uh, I'm sure, that the, this, this seeming divide between I'm a Persian, I'm Iranian. Did you, did you talk about that? Yeah, briefly. Yeah. Okay, good. I don't need to, to revisit that, do I? Yes. I was, uh, um, in actually the film we just saw a little clip of, there was a um, um, reciter at Ferdowsi's tomb who was declaiming the poetry. And uh, he said that one of the things that makes Ferdowsi such a hero of Persian culture is that he, when he uh, rewrote and, and uh, uh, created his poetic version of the Shahnameh stories, he did it without a single word borrowed from Arabic. And that it's essentially Persian. And I was, I was shocked because I'm thinking it, at that time period, how could you abstract out in an Islamic culture all of the words that came from Arabic? I'm so so I was, I sort of took that with a grain of salt. But I thought, huh, is that really, is that true? I'm so glad you mentioned that because I said there's, Sebastian well, drew on myths, but he has created, he, he didn't create, we have created a myth around Ferdowsi as our national poet. Well, it's a bit weird to talk about a national poet when at the time when Iran was not a nation in the mm -hmm. modern sense anyhow. But this is that it comes, it's ironic that it comes from a reciter <laughs> of the Shah Naman, because Fedusi actually in the opening of the Shah Naman talks about who he is and he talks about that he is a Muslim and a Shiite. And while he uses because the language at this time is not completely divorced from you know, the, the Persian word. He uses a language that is what sounds to our ears more like it's pure Persian. There's no such thing. He uses Arabic conjunctions, he uses Arabic words. Because at that point already, by the 11th century, Persian and Arabic had melded so much. In modern Persian, it is impossible to. This has been a project of nationalists for a very long time. And Fedosi, uh, our colleague Muhammad Tawakoli Tari has written about this, that already in the 16th, 17th centuries, Fedosi was a figure for proto-nationalists who wanted to say, you know, all we have to do is to go to the glories of pre-Islamic times, and Fedosi preserved it for us. You'll hear this from Iranians, from, you'll hear from students, you'll hear from parents, and they consider it sacrilege to say that he was a Muslim. <laughs> that he was, he in fact, used the language that drew on, moreover, I hate to say it, Arabic prosody. Yeah? Poetry, Persian, modern Persian poetry draw, draws heavily on Arabic. Without it, it's impossible to imagine modern Persian poetry. But this is a sentiment, it's a common sentiment. And I sometimes, in my own classes at UCI, I have to be very careful what I say, because my students will protest it. The young mm -hmm. students who have grown up in Southern California, Iranian Americans, will want to rip my head off, because they'll say, how can you say that he was a Muslim? He hated Islam. <laughs> that is our modern, and particularly post-revolutionary interpretation. Mm -hmm. Because there is this need to disavow Mm -hmm. Islam, the need to distance ourselves from that na that identity. Uh, so those are things to actually, I'm so glad you brought that up, to be conscious of. With Ferdowsi, we're never going to get through. <laughs> That's okay. We can, I, I'll just speed it up. So we have what would now, if you read in English about modern Persian, uh, about rather Persian history, uh, literary history, you would have the beginnings of uh, what they call classical verse. And most of pre-modern Iranian literature, Persian literature, literature written in Persian, I should say, is uh, in verse, predominantly in verse. That is not to say prose doesn't exist, but the form, the genre that dominates this verse, different kinds of versification. And this is the beginnings of where we would see poets like Hafiz, may I? I will ask to, for you to put of course. Uh, we, uh, the, the great figures that you, you, for your own interest, if you wanted to check, um, uh, what we in Persian we would call Molana, uh, but in, in a, now in the States there are so many translations, he's become known as Rumi. I gave you a reference to at least one sample of his poetry. Um, Attar. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Okay. That's fine. And um, Jami. Uh, 
a great number of, in English we refer to them as classical Persian poets. Now some of these are known as mystical poets, right? And one of the reasons for which Rumi has become such a big hot item now in uh, the US, or I think in the West, generally is, I don't know, it's my own view of it, is the, the, the sense of spirituality in it, huh? don't you think? They call them Vox translations and so on. And Hafiz too, I mean, you know, either these are poets that have been, um, we haven't just come to know them in the West, uh, as if I'm from the West, forget that. Uh, if they haven't just been popular in the West recently, you know, when you look at the 17th, 18th century, the first translations of Hafiz were done by a German, for instance, right? So there were people, where the, where the contacts were between Europe, Europe and Iran, the first instances, those classics were already known to the, the first Orientalists, the first people who studied the region and wanted to know that. And this poetry, known as, you know, represented by some of the figures, a lot of it is beautifully translated and available. I'm, I, I'm drawing a blank, but there are lots of uh, Saadi. I forgot Saadi. <laughs> I knew that there are other names that are not coming to me. Saadi is another poet. Uh, you know, sometimes you will see the term medieval. It's, it's, again, one of those terms that doesn't translate really well, because it's, it's almost like we're transposing. The same way classical doesn't really work, because we don't use it in Persian, you know? But we, we would refer to it as, you know, the, the wrong itself, the type of poetry it is. But in, it's become, because the first histories of Persian literature were written by Orientalists, they used terms that were close, brought or borrowed from the West. So these would be the classical poets. Um. I know that uh, poetry is often recited and remembered. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just wondering, uh, as you were growing up, did you, uh, remember, to memorize? Did you memorize any of this? And sure, could sure. you maybe? Uh, I was traumatized by it. Right? <laughs> 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 now, I can we hear some of what you think? Oh, yeah, you oh, yeah, I know. I, I even brought some to because I can't remember from memory. But I'll tell you, there's a, it's a psychotrauma for me. Uh, because I grew up in a household where my mother was a Mm, high school teacher of physics, but she has a passion for poetry and knows poetry by heart. Even to this day, our phone conversations turn into, you know, saying, you know, this reminds me of, and she'll tell me, she'll recite these verses. But, um, yeah, in high school, in Iran, when I was growing up, I'm sure it's still the case, we had to memorize a lot of poetry. And it didn't do me any good, because I know that it's supposed to help, but I, uh, well, the one that really traumatized me was not Hafiz, but rather the Shahnameh. And then you had to stand in front of the class and recite it. Right? Well, my mother was a, such a whiz at this that obviously I was going to fail, you know. <laughs> and I don't have very good memory for poetry. But yes, reciting these, it's, it's a major, uh, that's the other thing is that they say about, I'll come to that and I'll recite a little bit of Hafiz, is that, um, even people in the old days who were not literate could recite poetry and knew a lot of poetry precisely because, you know, you will remember it from memory. So, you know, the poem that I have is, is, is the, one of the famous ones. It's like the opening of the, the, the divan, the collection. Yeah. I hope you can hear the poetry in it, right? I hope you can hear the poetry in it, right? I hope you can hear the poetry in it, right? I hope you can hear the poetry in it, right? I hope you can hear the poetry in it, right? Yeah, you can hear the poetry. And it's obviously, I mean, I myself find that, and you will find Iranians like us fainting when we yes. hear poetry. Yeah. <laughs> it's beautiful. It's that the, the language is, you know, something that we have a, we've grown up with. Huh? We have a sense. Yes, uh, you, you have the same reaction. It, it, it's interesting that it crosses generations, I and mean, generations of my generation. Exactly, and it's very much part of everyday life, like in the back of trucks you will see verses. Yeah. People in their conversations use poetry. It's not something that you just <laughs> open a book and read it. It's really in the grain of our culture. And one of the fun things that I forgot to say, you say cultural practice, is 
this uh, probably have it in Arabic, Mushaire it's called. Mm, that's right. I was miserable at it, but my mother always won. <laughs> so what it is is that Mushaire is just an exchanging of verses. So somebody will say, Agar on Turkish Erosi Vidastara Dilemara, the letter with which the, the verse ends, somebody has to start a another verse. verse. That. It's so what I got good at is changing the verses and fabricating them. <laughs> 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 That's what I ran out of. What's the, what's the term for that exchange? Mosha in it. We can try to transliterate it for <laughs> Yeah, no, transliterate it the best we can. Yeah. And is Hafiz is called the Persian Quran, right? I, I hear what, that, that the that word has Hafiz. almost as reverence as the Quran itself, which is incredible. Well, there is a resonance, an additional to resonance, because Hafiz is a title, right? And it refers to he Some who has memorized, memorized the Quran. Mm -hmm. That's why he's also. Um, yeah, there's a lot of reverence, and precisely because, I mean, even to this day, uh, people will go to his tomb and do the augury, right? And there are wonderful stories about, you know, when Tagore went to his tomb and did, you know, made a wish and opened, and it, uh, the, the verse that came open to was uh, if that um, poet comes from India or something. So, you know, people just like, oh my God, Hafiz knows everything. And so <laughs> there, is, <laughs> there is. And actually, I consult Hafiz all the time. I do too. Don't you? I find like, you know, days where things are going really bad, I'll go it off my shelf and just say, Hafiz, tell me if it's going to get, I'm <laughs> going to get this through this day. Yes. And what's beautiful about Hafiz is that you can interpret it that way. <laughs> so occasionally things will come up and I feel like, uh oh, uh, no. this is not going to go well. <laughs> so yes, there's a lot of reverence for Hafiz. Now, Sadi and Drami and others, I mean, they wrote love poetry, but they also, the one thing I don't want to forget is that they also wrote uh, what we would uh, translate into, into English as uh, the, the tales for princes, you know, mirrors for princes, because these were court poets. Mm -hmm. not, not necessarily in the sense of rich court poets, but poetry was for the elite. And it's not like there were a lot of very literate people and these people had patrons. Even though the sad story about Ferdowsi is that after he finished, after he spent 30 years writing the Shahnameh, he didn't get his reward for it. And he died without getting it. So there, there are all those kinds of instances. It's not to say that because they, they lived through very rapidly changing times. Uh, we think of it as modern times rapidly changing, but the one monarchy coming, one person killing the other off, and you know, replacing one dynasty replacing another. So they didn't necessarily always have this continuous support, but they were what we could call court poets. And part of Persian poetry is not just love poetry and the beautiful; there are morals, right? Mm -hmm. Tales about, like Actors, um, sort of the mystical tale of the one that I love is Conference of the Birds, Mantarote. Oh, yes. I really love that. And Dick Davis has translated that too. It's a beautiful, I think it's a Penguin edition. Yeah, it's a Penguin edition. I just at the book and it saw somebody else translate it. I must get that and read it. But Dick is such a beautiful poet. How can you? Mm. Yeah. Conference of the Birds. There's that ugly Arabic word in there. No, I say that as a joke. <laughs> I, I, I'm starting to, since I've moved to two. Southern California, too, right? Since I've moved to Southern California, I, I love to tease my students in the class about it. Because at the beginning of the class, I always say, how many Persians in this class? A whole bunch of hands go up the first day. How many Iranians, maybe one or two? Then I said, what's the difference? And they start <laughs> 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 and, and, I, uh, and then I just say, and they say, well, Persian is this pure language of, you know, we have an identity with before Islam and so on and so forth. And then when we start talking about this beautiful poetry, I go, oh, gosh, our poets really messed up. They put all those Arabic words in there. <laughs> so uh, the, the, these are also tales, moral, right? Um, so, uh, uh, if it's the mystic's quest for self-perfection, as in Molana in Rumi's, you know, the poem that, uh, so many that are my favorite by Rumi, but let me just, a few lines of uh, this, you know, I think that 
this is one of the ones that I gave. Yes, that, yeah. that is yeah. the one. Yeah, the one that says, why think thus, O men, men of piety, I've returned to sobriety. I'm neither a Muslim nor a Hindu. I'm not Christian, Zoroastrian, nor Jew. That's the translation. Rumi is known for it, right? It's very difficult poetry to write, but that's kind of, you know, because the, the, the rules of prosody that he actually is known for. You actually recite this and you become breathless. You can see the, where the world in Dervish is, where the rhythms might come from, right? Yeah. So um, this poetry, the reason I just very quickly said that, <laughs> is that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to move out of class and call We're going to leave it <laughs> We're going to leave it and move yes, on. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah, I, w I just could you talk a little bit about the, the Khazal, or I don't know how to spell it. Yeah, yeah. So that's right. G H. Usually it's trans. Because trans that's, that's really made. Uh, an impact on modern poetry in America, as I understand it. So where where is that dating back to? Or uh, all like, of them yeah. would have written. Yeah. Molana wrote, Rumi wrote Ghazals. Okay. Hafez wrote Ghazals. Saidi has some Ghazals. And, but it's a form of poetry. Yeah. And it's translated, actually, if you look at, if you, uh, if we look at, I don't know, if it's, <coughs> oh yeah, unfortunately I don't have it. This, this doesn't. Is that it's, Sometimes I've seen it, literary critics who do comparative work will say it's more like a sonnet, an English sonnet. Well, it has a lot of rules to it. So oh, all of them do. They are all incredibly, all the poetic so forms. many different. Many yes. different. Like there is Raza, there is Raside, Rasnali, uh, there, uh, there are many forms. Okay. Many forms. And they just refer to the types of poetry, right? So for in, in, in English, you know, you would say. So the Ghazal would be sort of the closest thing that I've seen critics refer to is the sonnet. Ghazal tends to uh, lend itself more to love poetry, but love poetry in the sort of mystical sense. Um, but they are all, <coughs> I'm so glad you said that, they are all very tight rules about Because, uh, for instance, what is the rhythm? What's the rhyme? What's the rhyming scheme? Yeah, and you know, it, it, all of them in a sense have had an impact on modern poetry. Azal has been most imitated, huh? most taken up. For instance, when the German uh, poet uh, writer Goethe fell in love with the translations, the German translations that he had read of Hafez, he wrote his own Ghazal in imitation. Yeah, as a kind of a, I was inspired by your work. Oh, master, let me produce. That's what I did for my MA thesis. One of the novelists that I think I should mention before we get into poetry that is you will come across is Hedayat, uh, The Blind Owl, Bufakur. It is quite the work. It's a very short novel, but it's been translated in French and German and English. It's still available when I teach it all the time. It freaks everyone out. <laughs> it has elements of surrealism. When we were growing up in Iran, my generation, I think it's still the case, we weren't allowed to read Sadeh Hedayat because it's so bleak. And moreover, Sadeh Hedayat committed suicide, so they thought if he read his work, he might commit suicide. I don't know. Anyway. Um, so Sadeh Hedayat is one of the major figures of modern Persian prose. I uh, gave you an example of Jamal Zadeh. He has short stories. He has uh, um, the great work, The Blind Owls, is written about in just about every language. It's not a hefty novel. Then we come to the beginnings of an interesting change in poetry. Shereno, which is literally means new poetry. New poetry, the, the great figure of, the sort of the father of uh, new poetry, modern Persian poetry, is Nima Yushich, who wrote poetry that either played with the conventions of classical Persian poetry or completely defied them. So he broke with the forms. You know, I, I, I told you that the forms are all rigid. What? Well, rigid. They are set. If you're going to write a passy day, it's like this. So this is the beginning of the introduction of blank verse. So, and with that came the poetry parallel and at the same time as prose 
also attempted to approach the ordinary per person in the streets, right? So the poetry was, in their view, when you read the poet's own interpretation of what they were doing, they were trying to make it more, more, more accessible to mm -hmm, ordinary people. I don't know how. Sometimes when I read their poems, I think, really? You <laughs> 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 yeah. People can just easily read these and interpret them. Right. <laughs> yeah. But Rima Yushij is sort of a, a key figure of modern Persian poetry, but with, with that came an unleashing of a great number of you know, talents. And and I, Please. Please do. Please do. Um, and the, the one that Anna has been really very interested in getting to right away, and Ron and I too, because we just actually have just come out with a book on Furofa is the great poet that we all love and adore, this uh, female poet, um, Furofa Rokhsad who is an iconic figure, because she is the first, while there were other female uh, poets before her, she is the first figure who wrote about women's desires, women's sexuality. And she was a bold a person who did not mind, actually, both in her life and in her poetry, breaking the conventions. And uh, when it comes to form, also, we see in her poetry, in her collections of poetry, lots of change as a, as a poet who herself developed over the course of her career. She has five collections of poetry. Unfortunately, she died very young in a car accident. Um, she, if she had lived, she would have oh, produced even masterpieces. And she's also a figure who is, she's an interesting figure because she's also associated with the beginnings of what we call new Iranian cinema. Right, all the films that we hear of Sami, Mahmoud, Wolf, and other stuff, they all pay homage to Furu Farouk because of a documentary she made um, called The House is Black. Now, if someday you are really in the mood for a bleak film, <laughs> <laughs> it's only 20 really minutes. <laughs> it, she made a documentary. It was a documentary that was commissioned by. I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Has a mind of its own. Yeah, uh, documentary commissioned in 1961, uh, 62, by the Society for the Protection of Letters in Iran, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it was not a planned. Uh, it is not a documentary in the sense that we're used to seeing in the conventions of documentary. She filmed for a few days, then she left, and then she the. What she did with it, first of all, aside from the montages and the various work, all the work that she did cinematically, she used voiceover, which is her own voice, and poetry for the film. Yeah. So <coughs> when we hear about poetic cinema, new Iranian cinema being poetic cinema, the filmmakers themselves pay homage to her and say how much they're influenced by her work, and that she, that was the beginning of it. Now, do you know any sort of song from memory that you could recite? Just a few verses. Would you? Just, just, just like. Just a few. Know, that's fine. Uh, but but more than is. Nothing. Yeah. Or the one that she's so famous for. Which one is it? Manin Jobasta. Em furuga na furuga is manin Jobasta lam tangeras. Manin sozi ke mi. Manin sozi ke mi mi nam chada da hangeras ya rah mushabar dori. No, that's not for that's, You're right. That's so yeah. That, yeah, that's right. So, that's right. So, yeah. She's she should have led this in no. 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 You have thanks to Anna, you have the Please. great great very few. Of great very few. Yes. I, I, I can't find the email, but I on my anniversary I sent my husband a poem. Uh, by Farouk Sad and um, it was I mean he said he had to leave the office because he was so he was so moved and and it, you know it's incredibly it's erotic it's um, so intimate and yeah. and so and lyrical at the same time it's absolutely so if you want to knock the socks off your partner male or female you know the way to do it on Valentine's Day is to find some short piece of photo photo that that speaks to you because um, in any language, I mean, these are translations, but there's no, you know, I haven't found love poetry that that um, that speaks so powerfully. I mean, it goes straight to your um, to your heart. And one of the debates that I have with some of my graduate students 
is that they say, ah, it's not any good compared to what it was before. But the fact that so many people are writing poetry, and some critics from Iran, and I must say, some of the, uh, my colleagues I respect immensely, ha I, you know, analyze some of the new poetry and say, it's, it's poor in quality compared. But it's so powerful, people. I somehow remember that poetry is embedded in the Islamic uh, culture because they used to have competitions for yeah. who was more powerful, so yeah. that instead of mm -hmm. fights, that there would actually absolutely. be absolutely uh, poetry com competitions. So yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah, and that's where Iranians got it. <coughs> I mean, that's what I'm saying is that to imagine this entire rich legacy, including the modern, by the way, which it didn't just completely throw everything out. I mean, they, the poets, the modern poets who, who are prominent, they were referring to it, changing it, playing with it, but they were still working. All of that comes from Arabic. And without what changed, well, I'm just reading an article, a brilliant article about how Persian prose, this particular lost figure of sort of a, a, mm, a rhetorician who talked about what we could do in Persian that was different from Arabic, you know, uh, they played with it, but it came from Arabic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry I don't have more time. I would go on forever and bore you. If you were in my class, there some of my undergraduates who I was teaching for rule and they looked so bored, and I said, come on, nothing shocks you. And they started laughing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.